This is a video on the second part of my paper on Bayesianism in Philosophy Compass. I'll link the video to the first part in the description. I'm Kenny Eastwine, and as a reminder, although the paper says University of Southern California, I'm currently at Texas A&M University. I'll link my website in the description, so and that'll have updated information whenever you're watching this. Philosophy Compass is a journal aimed at orienting people in a topic in philosophy, so there's not much original work in these papers but there's a lot of pointers to things that you can read about in more detail elsewhere. As a reminder from the first video, the basic idea of Bayesianism is that there's a concept of Bayesian probability or credence or degree of belief that represents how confident someone is in something. Unlike traditional views in epistemology, we don't just believe or disbelieve something, but instead have something that comes in degrees, which we can measure with the mathematics of probability. Unlike other views of probability, Bayesian probability is not about chances in the world or frequencies of repeatable events, but it's rather a subjective and personal thing about how confident someone may or may not be in things they're reasoning about with uncertainty. When you gather new evidence, you don't so much change what you believe as you update your probabilities. Most of the time, you'll never reach full certainty, one or zero, for the interesting claims. They'll just move up or down. The first part of the paper discussed in the previous video goes more into these basic concepts and the sorts of arguments that philosophers use for why it makes sense to think of these degrees of belief to be thought of as probabilities. Basically, if we think of these degrees of belief as determining how someone acts in light of the uncertainty in the world, then, these acts would somehow be self-defeating if the degrees of belief weren't like probabilities. That is, you'd be able to tell that there's a set of acts where you think of each one as favorable, but you'd be able to see that if you did all of them, then on any possibility you could imagine, the net result would be worse than if you had done none of them. This is all to say that if you're going to act in light of your degrees of belief, you should do so in ways that improve things from your standpoint. And so a rational person would have degrees of belief that obey the laws of probability. I mentioned, but I didn't discuss in detail in that previous video, that there's also arguments that don't rely on this connection between degrees of belief and action. Instead, if we just want degrees of belief to be accurate, that is close to the truth and far from falsehoods, then if you don't obey the mathematics of probability, Again, there's another set of degrees of belief that you could guarantee would be more accurate than your own. In this second part of the paper, I explore the implications of Bayesian probability for several different areas of research. I mentioned how we can use Bayesian probability to understand scientific reason. Why is it that particular types of evidence count as supporting a scientific hypothesis, even though David Hume argued that it's impossible to justify any belief that goes beyond the direct evidence. But I'll also mention various problems that arise in the use of Bayesian probability for explaining scientific inference. I'll also discuss how Bayesian probability replaces the concepts that we have from epistemology of belief and knowledge, and discuss some ideas for how these concepts might be related to Bayesian probability, again, with their own challenges. I end with some discussion of what Bayesianism means for statistics, and also some brief discussion of alternative frameworks to Bayesianism in various academic fields. The discussion in this second part of the paper is necessarily a little bit more technical. We'll be working with the abstract math of probability theory, though, without filling in particular numbers. There's many videos you can find on YouTube of people showing how to do particular calculations of probability with particular numbers. But here, we're focusing on some of the general mathematical features. Although it's somewhat more technical than the previous video, it still won't involve any detailed calculations. There's also going to be some standardized notation that I use throughout the second part. I'll add this to the margin and keep it there for the rest of the video. The letter H is always going to be used to stand for a hypothesis, the sort of claim that we don't directly observe, but that we're instead interested in drawing inferences about on the basis of our evidence. I might add subscripts to H, if there are multiple hypotheses under consideration. The letter E will always be used for a piece of evidence, 
the sort of thing that you could directly observe that may be of relevance to hypotheses. Again, I'll add subscripts to E if there are multiple potential pieces of evidence that you might learn. We'll usually be talking about a scientist's degrees of belief before they've done their experiment. So we'll say P of H, the probability of H, is the prior probability of H. We'll call P of H given E the posterior probability. It's what your new degree of belief in H would be if you were to learn E as evidence. And Remember, we're usually going to be talking about these things before the person's actually got the evidence. So this is all hypothetical. The posterior would become the prior if you got the evidence, but sometimes we're interested in what would be the effect of this evidence rather than that evidence. So we'd be interested in these different posteriors. One other weird technical term, the word likelihood is used for probability of E given H. The way to think about this is this is how likely the hypothesis makes the evidence. You'll sometimes hear people talking about the likelihood of the hypotheses, and you might think that they mean this is how likely the hypothesis is, but that's not what it means. It's confusing. The ordinary word likelihood is used for how probable the thing in question is, but in this sort of context, likelihood always is about how probable the hypothesis makes the evidence, not the hypothesis itself. The likelihoods of the hypotheses play a special role in statistical reasoning, because very often it turns out scientists can come to an agreement about the likelihoods of various hypotheses for various pieces of evidence, even if the scientists disagree on the priors and posteriors of the hypothesis and the evidence. One of the major criticisms of Bayesianism is that it's too subjective. And people sometimes think that keeping the focus on the likelihoods can keep our scientific reasoning more objective. Anyway, we'll see how that all comes up. OK, the first thing I'm going to talk about is Bayesian confirmation theory. This is in philosophy of science when we're interested in understanding how does evidence support a hypothesis. One of the important early uses of probability theory in philosophy was in Rudolf Carnap's book, The Logical Foundations of Probability. He argued that one notion of probability corresponding, something, corresponding to something like rational degree of belief, though he had in mind a somewhat more purely logical notion that gives rise to constraints on degrees of belief rather than working with degree of belief itself. So Carnap argued that the best analysis of the scientific notion of confirmation was going to be through probability. Like Hempel before him, Carnap sought not just a qualitative theory of whether a given piece E of evidence confirms, disconfirms, or is neutral with respect to a hypothesis H, but also a quantitative theory of when E1 confirms H1 more or less strongly than E2 confirms H2, and possibly even an absolute quantitative scale of the degrees of confirmation. However, Carnap's book had an unfortunate ambiguity between two different measures of confirmation pointed out by Karl Popper. Because this ambiguity was so pervasive in Carnap's book, he never fixed it, although he acknowledged the problem in the second edition. As it's often put, the ambiguity is between an absolute notion of confirmation as firmness, the posterior of the hypothesis after you've learned the evidence, and an incremental notion of increase in firmness, something like the change from the prior to the posterior, either one of which can be seen as something like the amount of support E gives to H. To see the difference, imagine that I've just taken a pregnancy test and it comes back negative. After having looked at this pregnancy test, I am extremely confident that I am not pregnant. However, it seems that there's a high degree of firmness here. I am extremely confident that I'm not pregnant after having looked at that pregnancy test but there was very little increase in firmness. I was very confident that I was not pregnant even before taking a pregnancy test. So the pregnancy test did almost nothing to increase my confidence in my not being pregnant. So uh, there's very high firmness, very low increase in firmness. And that's an unfortunate ambiguity. We wanna know how much does the evidence contribute to the uh, hypothesis, not just 
how strongly do you believe the hypothesis after you have the evidence? Since this distinction has been clarified, most Bayesian measures of confirmation have aimed at something more like the latter, this incremental notion, this increase of firmness. Though the confusion is an easy one to make and has often been made by others since, I found myself making the same confusion many times and it's something to constantly watch out for. Are you paying attention to how much difference a piece of evidence makes or are you paying attention to how confident you are after receiving the evidence? Thus, Bayesian confirmation theorists traditionally analyze the qualitative notion of confirmation by saying E confirms H if and only if the posterior of H, the prior probability of H after learning E is greater than the prior of H. Though there's still controversy about whether the probability function is someone's degrees of belief, one of these Bayesian probability functions of some particular agent at some particular time, or if it's some other probability function, maybe something more abstract and logical. And also whether or not there should be extra propositions beyond E that we're conditionalizing on. Bayes' theorem states that the posterior of H is equal to the prior of H times the likelihood that H gives the evidence divided by the prior of the evidence. So that as usual, assuming that for now that none of the probabilities are zero, the posterior is greater than the prior if and only if the likelihood is greater than the prior of the evidence. Given the standard Bayesian picture of update by conditionalization, we can see that if P of H is the degree of belief a scientist had in H before conducting her experiment, and E is the unique proposition she learns as the result of performing the experiment, then P of H given E will be her degree of belief in H after performing the experiment. Thus, an experiment confirms a hypothesis as expected, if and only if the scientist's degree of belief in the hypothesis increases as a result of performing the experiment. There's much standard terminology in Bayesian confirmation theory. This is a repeat of what I've already said. Understandably, P of H is called the prior, P of H given E is called the posterior, but confusingly, P of E given H is called the likelihood of the hypothesis. When discussing Bayesian confirmation theory, the apparent synonyms probability and likelihood actually have different meanings. Thus, E confirms H if and only if the posterior is greater than the prior, or equivalently, if and only if the likelihood is greater than the initial degree of belief in the evidence. Although Bayesians agree on all of this, there's still a lot of disagreement about the measure of a quantitative notion of confirmation. Because of the clarity and success of the increase in firmness understanding of confirmation, it has often been assumed that the appropriate measure of confirmation is just the difference, the posterior minus the prior. However, it can easily be seen that this measure makes it impossible to confirm a theory very strongly if the prior is already high, since the posterior must always be at most one. For much of the past few months, I've been taking rapid COVID tests in the morning. And so far, these tests have all come out negative. I was already pretty confident that I wasn't sick on any of those days, but I want to say that these tests gave me some significant evidence. But if I started out 99% confident that I wasn't sick, all the test could do is push me from 99% to 99.99%. That's only an increase of less than 1%. As a result, many other measures other than this difference have been proposed, disagreeing about the relative strengths of different confirmations. But they all agree about when there is confirmation, disconfirmation, or irrelevance. So one alternative is posterior of H given E minus posterior of H given naughty. E. So we don't just look how, how much did this increase compared to not having any evidence, but how much did my confidence increase compared to having the opposite evidence. So uh, here, that would make sense of the COVID test my confidence in not having COVID given that my test was negative is much higher than my confidence in not having COVID given that my test was positive. Another alternative is the ratio of the likelihoods. Instead of taking the difference of these, uh, instead of taking the difference of the posteriors, take the ratio of the likelihoods or take the ratio of the posterior to the prior. Uh, 
And the ratio of the posterior to the prior turns out by the Bayes theorem to also equal the ratio of the likelihood to the prior of the evidence, among others. Each of these measures has been argued for and against in a variety of publications, and each has also been applied to the analysis of various apparent cases of confirmation. There are some people who think all of these measures are doing something interesting and important, but some philosophers think one of these might be getting at the concept of confirmation or scientific support. One famous series of analyses discussed in depth by Brandon Feitelson in his paper in Philosophy Compass is about the paradox of the ravens. This paradox arises from an observation made by Carl Hempel that his particular logical theory of confirmation predicts that first, the observation of a black raven would, as you expect, confirm the hypothesis that all ravens are black. But according to his theory, we would also discover that the observation of a non-black non-raven, like a green apple or a white shoe or a red herring, would also confirm the hypothesis. And many people think this is a problem for Hempel's account of confirmation because uh, black ravens and non-black non-ravens would both confirm the hypothesis. A number of Bayesians eventually showed that on their account, neither of these confirmation relations necessarily holds. It's all going to depend on how you think the uh, evidence was generated and how likely you would think different types of evidence would be to arise given the different hypotheses. But uh, one particular analysis by Janina Hoshas and Lindenbaum, uh, which seems very plausibly to match the, uh, the intuitions that we have, she argues that the confirmation given by a black raven is quite a bit greater than the confirmation given by a non-black non-raven. A lot of this work was done in the years between World War I and World War II. People like Hempel, Carnap, Hoshas and Lindenbaum uh, many of these people were Jewish or socialists and were working in continental Europe and tried to flee during the Nazis. Uh, Carnap and Hempel came to universities in the United States and worked for many decades. Unfortunately, Hoshassen was killed by the Nazis. And, uh, uh, and there's been a lot of work since this period, but much of it was developed in that interwar period in Europe. The fact that there are a variety of measures of confirmation is still quite troubling. As pointed out by Brandon Feitelson in some of his other work, several analyses of the paradox of the ravens depend strongly on which particular measure of confirmation is being used. Uh, Hoshasen's account, I believe, uses the ratio analysis, but maybe it's the likelihood ratio. And I think it doesn't work on some of the other measures. However, David Christensen argues that this variety of measures is actually a good thing because some of them can capture intuitive comparisons of confirmation that others fail to recognize. And thus he argues that Bayesian confirmation theorists ought to be pluralists about the measurement of confirmation. These measures all agree about whether or not there is confirmation in any case, but they have drastic disagreements about the relative importance of different pieces of evidence. And that of course is exactly what's going on in the Ravens case. Maybe both pieces of evidence confirm but one of them confirms significantly and the other one only insignificantly. Okay, second section, some problems for Bayesian confirmation theory. Despite the successes of Bayesian confirmation theory in dealing with old paradoxes and analyzing many standard cases of confirmation, many problems for the theory have been posed. This first one, the Popper-Miller argument. At the time I wrote this paper, I thought of this as a significant objection to be included, but I no longer think this was even worth the space, but I'll go through it anyway since I wrote it down. One apparently serious problem for Bayesian confirmation theory comes from Karl Popper and David Miller in a paper they published in Nature in 1983. I think this got a lot of attention because it was published in Nature, which is this extremely prestigious interdisciplinary journal. And Karl Popper is one of the giants of 20th century philosophy of science, but I think it's got a lot of problems. Popper had already long argued that there could be no such thing as inductive support, no such thing as non-deductive confirmation. Instead, he endorses a view on which deductive falsification and falsifiability were the only relative, relevant epistemic features of a scientific theory. His view is that scientists never confirm hypotheses. All they do is they propose them, they do experiments, and they sometimes reject them. 
if it fails to be rejected, that uh, he thinks that doesn't increase any support for it. It's just, it hasn't been rejected. Science is a branch of logic in his view, but it's falsification logic. But this, this particular argument, the Popper-Miller argument, claimed to show that in particular, Bayesian confirmation also couldn't give inductive support for a theory. Their argument is that first, the hypothesis H is logically equivalent to this logically complex sentence, either H or E and either H or not E. And so they say, since H is equivalent to that conjunction of two disjunctions, they say the support that E gives to H could be separated into the support E gives to H or E and the support E gives to H or not E. But the first piece of support, the support that E gives to H or E is clearly deductive. Therefore, it's not inductive. While the second piece of support, the support that E gives to H or not E, turns out to always be neutral or negative. And so therefore they conclude there is no such thing as positive inductive support. However, this argument rests on several clear mistakes as described in the very many responses that are cited by John Ehrman in his book, Bayes or Bust? Question mark. First of all, there's no reason that support for a conjunction could be factored into support for the conjuncts. Second, there's many different ways to express H as a conjunction, one conjunct of which is deduct deductively entailed by E. And for some of those, there clearly is positive support, say if H itself is the other conjunct. And perhaps most embarrassingly, Popper seems to have made exactly the same mistake that he pointed out to Carnap three decades earlier. He tried to factor the support into two components by, but he was thinking of the support as probability of H given E, the posterior. But he forgot to think of this as an increase, the increase from the prior of H to the posterior H given E. So this apparent problem by Popper and Miller, I think is not a serious one for Bayesian confirmation theory. Though it does point out the fact that inductive and deductive support are hard to tell apart sometimes. The observation of a given raven as being black gives some minor deductive support to the hypothesis that all ravens are black by showing that one potential falsifier doesn't falsify it. But the more interesting question is what inductive support it gives to the claim that other ravens are black. And we'll come back to that later on. Second problem, logical omniscience. A far more serious worry for Bayesianism is the problem of logical omniscience. The problem is just that rational agents are often uncertain about logical truths. Consider logic students who don't recognize a certain claim as a tautology. One of the things you're trying to do in a logic class, you're trying to study and learn which of these things are logically guaranteed to be true and which ones are not. You don't automatically know it. And even the most rational logic student or even the most rational logic teacher always has some logical implications that they fail to recognize. Or mathematicians wondering about whether or not a given conjecture follows from the axioms. Again, Fermat's last theorem was only shown to follow from the axioms of arithmetic several centuries after Fermat first conjectured it. And it's not that the mathematicians in between were irrational. However, the standard probability axioms seem to entail that any logical truth must get probability one. And thus, any rational agent must be certain of any logical truth. I say seem to entail because Kolmogorov's axioms as stated in the abstract way that I gave in the previous paper, do not actually entail this particular claim. However, if we take the normal interpretation where the set of possibilities is the set of all possibilities so that logical truths are, are true in all possible worlds, uh, then if we state that the set of possibilities is some set of logically or metaphysically possible worlds and identify propositions with the set of worlds in which they are true, then logical truths are going to be true in every possibility and therefore get probability one. And for those who are aware of metaphysical necessities that aren't logical necessities, those would also get probability one. And that again, seems problematic. We might try to reject this standard interpretation of the set of worlds. What I've done in some other work is I've tried to suggest these 
possibilities shouldn't be thought of as logical possibilities or metaphysical possibilities, but some special personal possibilities, epistemic possibilities. But this then raises problems for the connection between the set theoretic operations of complementation and intersection, which the axioms deal with, and the semantic operations and language of negation and conjunction, which are needed in the interpretation of this as talking about sentences. An early approach of this sort is that of Ian Hacking, which uses the notion of personal possibility. Whatever the problems for the Kolmogorov axioms, the problem for a more syntactic axiomatization of probability is even worse, one where the objects that have probabilities are sentences rather than sets. Since these versions clearly do entail logical omniscience and the prospects for changing the interpretation of the theory are less clear. Dan Garber does give, as part of an attempt to resolve the old evidence problem, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, he does give a way to change the interpretation that has some potential. He suggests that although the agent whose degrees of beliefs we're talking about uses one language, there's no reason for the theorist who is talking about this agent and about their degrees of belief to represent them by using a probability function defined on that very same language. Instead, we just treat each sentence of the agent's language as a separate sentential atom. If you know sentential logic, these would be atomic sentences. And then we apply the probability axioms to the language for sentential logic built on top of those atoms. This makes every sentence of the agent's language, including the logical truths, come out contingent. So none of them are required to have probability one. However, this proposal does preserve logical omniscience in the new language, and it raises the question of why this theorist language omits the logical structure of the ancient agent's language, even whether the agent does recognize it. So this isn't a proper approach to logical omniscience. It just allows us to sort of bracket the problem and step aside from it while still using probability to understand how these logically non-omniscient agents reason. Another more sophisticated approach comes from Heim Geifman, who preserves the agent's language, but gives a different syntactic axiomatization of probability theory based on a designated finite fragment of the agent's language. He shows that under his axioms, the agent is only required to be logically omniscient about statements that have a de deductive proof every one of whose steps is in this designated fragment. If this fragment is taken to be the sentences that are short enough for the agent to grasp, because remember a language in this syntactic sense is going to include infinitely many sentences that are as long as you can imagine and longer than you can imagine. Uh, so this restricts your logical omniscience to just the ones that are small enough for you to understand. If the fragment is taken to be the sentences short enough for the agent to grasp, then there will generally be many sentences that are themselves short enough to grasp, but all of whose proofs require steps that are too long to grasp. This might be what's going on with Fermat's last theorem. Fermat himself never imagined many of the statements that come up in the middle of Andrew Wiles's proof that was published in the 1990s. Thus, full logical omniscience is avoided. However, there seem to be some cases where this doesn't work, where the problem is that the agent has just never considered each step in the proof in the right order, not that the agent can't grasp the individual steps. Geifman's approach does nothing to deal with this sort of non-omniscience. Yet another possible alternate approach is to say that Bayesian theory is an attempt to model ideal agents, but that actual scientists and mathematicians are non-ideal, and so there is no problem. This response is problematic to the extent that the lack of logical omniscience figures in the application of Bayesian confirmation theory to understanding the practices of actual as opposed to ideal scientists, as in some of the responses to the problem of old evidence, which I'll mention below. But if these applications are less important, then this is not a significant problem. And chapter six of David Christensen's book has more discussion of this particular response. Thus, there are several approaches to this problem, but there is as yet no fully satisfactory one. I suspect that approaches based on modifying the interpretation of the set and Kolmogorov's axiomatization will be more promising than more syntactic approaches, but this remains to be seen. One thing I should add, a few years after I published this paper, another interesting approach to the problem of logical omniscience was published by 
Scott Garibrandt and a few co-authors. Uh, I'll link to that in the description. Uh, I still think it doesn't fully solve the issue. He introduces a sort of computational model where the agent approaches ideal theory over time, but is never ideal at any moment. At any moment, their degrees of belief fail to satisfy the probability axioms, but they get closer and closer at every point in time. I still think there's problems with that approach, but I think it's one of the most interesting and promising new approaches to this problem since the time I published this paper. Third problem, old evidence. Another problem for Bayesianism, originally discussed by Clark Bleemore in his Why I Am Not a Bayesian, is the problem of old evidence. The problem, as it was originally posed, is that by the standard Bayesian axioms, if the probability of your evidence is one already, if the prior probability of the evidence is one, then the posterior of H is going to equal the prior of H, and so E cannot confirm H. However, in actual scientific practice, it does seem that old evidence can confirm new hypotheses. The standard example is one of the historically most important pieces of support for Einstein's general theory of relativity. The perihelion shift of Mercury had long been known to disagree with the value predicted by Newtonian theory. This had been observed at least since the 1860s that Mercury's orbit was rotating around the sun slightly differently from what Newton thought. And in 1915, when Einstein was working on his theory of general relativity, he was already aware of this, but he came up with two important confirmations of general relativity. One of them was he noticed that general relativity actually made a prediction about Mercury's perihelion shift that lined up with the evidence. But since Einstein had long known the value of the perihelion shift of Mercury, he must already have assigned it probability one. And thus, the standard Bayesian account says that it could not have confirmed his hypothesis. This is different from the other major piece of evidence that is often cited is there were new observations in 1919 of stars during a solar eclipse whose gravity was being bent by the sun's light. Bayesian theory can say, how is it that a new observation could confirm Einstein's theory, but it doesn't seem to be able to say how the old observation could. One approach to this problem, which Dan Garber endorses in the paper I was mentioning earlier, is to concede that the perihelion shift itself gave no con confirmation for Einstein's theory. Instead, it's the fact that Einstein's theory entailed the perihelion shift that gave the confirmation. Thus, the confirmation comes from a piece of logical learning rather than from the old evidence itself. This approach clearly requires a solution to the problem of logical omniscience, but since this problem needs solution anyway, it reduces two problems for the Bayesian to one. However, as pointed out by Ellery Ells in his 1985 paper, this example is only one type of old evidence problem. For Einstein, we could make a reasonable case that the new logical information was in fact the piece of evidence that confirmed his theory, rather than the old perihelion shift data. But for modern scientists, both the logical fact and the perihelion shift have probability one. So neither one can do the confirmation. And similarly, for modern scientists, the 1919 eclipse observations are also old. So all three of these things, the perihelion shift, the eclipse data, and the logical entailment that Einstein's theory gives to the perihelion shift, all three of these things are old. So none of them can confirm Einstein's theory for us. But Els calls this the problem of old new evidence. That is evidence that's already known, but was recognized as relevant when it was new. While in Einstein's case, we have the problem of new old evidence. That is evidence that was already known, but is only newly recognized as relevant to a theory. The problem of old new evidence that is like the eclipse data and the related problem of old, old evidence, uh, uh, which is how we, uh, how we deal with Einstein and the perihelion shift, which is just a historical case of new old evidence. These three problems point out that Bayesian confirmation theory doesn't seem to be able to account for the confirmational relations among evidence and hypothesis that scientists now take to be well-established. It can talk about how 
gaining new evidence confirms your hypothesis, but not what is the logical relation among the evidence you already have for a hypothesis. A first response to this problem is to consider the time at which the putative evidence had been new and to see whether the evidence confirmed the hypothesis with respect to the historical probability function at that time. However, there's no reason to suppose that these confirmation relations have remained the same. A piece of evidence that was seen as monumental at the time may now be seen as irrelevant in light of later developments or vice versa. So an approach is needed that somehow appeals to the present probability function rather than to the time when the evidence was new. One approach is to return to the question of which probability function P should be used in the inequality, P of H given E is greater than P of H. Rather than using the agent's actual degree of belief function, which has P of E equals one, and therefore P of H given E equals P of H, one might use the degree of belief function the agent would have had if she hadn't already known E. However, as pointed out by John Ehrman, there may be no unique such function, and the function may differ from the actual one in confounding ways. A more extreme version of this problem is endorsed in, by Timothy Williamson, as well as by Rudolf Carnap, where they suggest that P is, in fact, some sort of hypothetical prior that the agent would have had in the absence of any empirical knowledge whatsoever. However, many Bayesians find these hypothetical prior functions even more problematic than the hypothetical ones where you remove just a single piece of evidence. And this suggestion seems to ignore the fact that much evidence is only evidence in light of other background knowledge, that all the fossils that we have that seem to support evolutionary theory, most of those fossils wouldn't support anything if it weren't for all sorts of other pieces of evidence that we have. Another approach taken by some Bayesians is to endorse only Jeffrey conditionalization and not strict conditionalization. Thus, even though the evidence may be old in some sense, it won't have probability one, and therefore we could have probability of H given E is different from P of H. There is still a question of which measure of confirmation to use, as several of the measures guarantee that when P of E is close to one, as seems natural for old evidence even on this picture, there's almost no confirmation. However, Christensen points out that some of the other measures can do the right job here, so that if we take a pluralist picture, then this approach seems to work. But this still seems to make the evidential relations already holding between an agent's beliefs dependent on how future increases in P of E would affect P of H, which seems to get something conceptually wrong. Thus, there's still work to be done on the problem of old evidence, though a variety of approaches allow most Bayesians not to worry about it. Fourth problem, new theories. These previous two problems bring out the point that Bayesian confirmation theory seems to have no way to account for the effect of the development of a new theory. In a sense, the logical omniscience assumed in Bayesian theory goes beyond assigning probability one to tautologies. And it also requires assigning probabilities to every sentence whatsoever, regardless of which ones the agent may have actually ever considered. Newton would have had some prior for Einsteinian relativity. Einstein would have had some prior for relativity even before he thought of it. The problem of old evidence is a serious problem because there seems to be a difference between the evidential relations between an old piece of evidence that a new hypothesis happens to explain, like in Einstein's case, and an old piece of evidence that a new hypothesis was specifically designed to accommodate. Somehow, the logical entailment relation between the hypothesis and the evidence seems like it should be much more relevant in one case than the other, even though the theory had no prior before it was thought up. The idea is that if you come up with a theory to explain one piece of evidence, then that evidence doesn't support the theory as much as if you come up with a theory for a different reason, and then you discover that it explains the piece of evidence. It also often seems that the introduction of a new theory induces a change in degrees of belief that can't be achieved by conditionalization or Jeffrey conditionalization, so that a new form of Bayesian update must be proposed. Thus, if Bayesianism is intended to help us understand actual scientific practice rather than an extremely idealized version of it, a lot must be done to explain the role the introduction of new theories plays in science. 
And for an attempt to resolve the problem this way, see Patrick Maher's work. Fifth problem, the problem of the priors. This brings us to perhaps the biggest problem facing Bayesian confirmation theory, which is the problem of the priors. Bayes' theorem shows that the posterior probability of h given e is equal to the likelihood probability of e given h divided by the prior of the evidence multiplied by the prior of the hypothesis. So that whether the posterior is greater than the prior just depends on whether the likelihood is greater than the prior of the evidence. Although some argument might be made for an objective assignment of the value for the likelihood, for instance, many scientific theories explicitly attach probabilities to various observational outcomes. And it seems reasonable for a scientist who knows these values to take them as their likelihood. That is, many biological theories tell you what's the probability of certain kinds of mutation. Quantum mechanics tells you the probabilities of various kinds of uh, uh, events. Theories about the distribution of cards in a deck tell you the probability that these different hands would be dealt. All of these likelihoods seem like they're given by the hypothesis. So it seems that the likelihoods are objective, but there doesn't really seem to be an objective way to specify the prior P of E. There's a way to specify the prior P of E if you're given the priors of all the hypotheses and the likelihoods of the, those hypotheses give the evidence, but that just pushes it back to the priors of the hypotheses. In fact, most Bayesians. I'm not so sure that it's most Bayesian, but at the time I wrote this, I thought it was most Bayesians, argue that many different priors are all permissible, whether the agents have the same background evidence or not. Thus, the picture given by Bayesian confirmation theory seems to indicate that the same evidence can provide confirmation for a hypothesis for one scientist, but disconfirmation of the same hypothesis for a different scientist. If this is right, then it seems to undermine the objectivity of science. If you and I can both look at the same evidence and I say the evidence supports the hypothesis and you say it disconfirms the hypothesis, what are we doing? What's objective here? The responses to this problem lead to some of the most fundamental divisions among Bayesians. Some Bayesians are quite impressed by this problem and thus suggest that there should in fact be a unique objective set of prior probabilities that it is rational to have in every situation. Such objective Bayesians, who seem to dominate among Bayesians in physics and the other sciences, often prefer Cox's argument over the other justifications of Bayesianism, because Cox's argument just presupposes their contention that there is a unique prior to be had. And in some cases, it even gives values for this prior. In particular, it supports what we call the principle of indifference, saying that rational agents should divide their credences equally among possibilities if they have no evidence favoring one over another. However, subjective Bayesians who tend to dominate among Bayesians in philosophy, and that's the part I'm no longer so sure about, I think there's a lot of Bayesians in philosophy these days who endorse some sort of objective Bayesianism, though I lean towards subjective Bayesianism. Uh, subjective Bayesians point out that the principle of indifference has already been shown by Bertrand, Joseph Bertrand in 1889, to have serious problems, even before the birth of modern Bayesianism. And the problem known as Bertrand's paradox takes many different forms, but the central issue is the same. When there are infinitely many possibilities, there are different incompatible ways to divide them up where applying the principle of indifference gives different results. Paraphrasing a statement of the problem that Van Frossen gave, we can imagine knowing only that a particular cubicle box has side length somewhere between one and three meters long. Then it seems like we should assign credence one half to the side between being between one and two meters and the other half to between two and three. But we could equally well describe the situation in terms of the surface area of the side. If the side is from one to three, then the surface area is from one to nine, in which case, seems like it's three eighths that it's between one and four rather than out of since one to four is three out of the eight units between one and nine. But we've now assigned two different credences to equivalent propositions, which is absurd. E.T. James tries to give a resolution to the specific example that Bertrand gave that involves chords in a circle. 
And that's in his paper, The Well Post Problem. But even he states that objective Bayesians must still do a lot of work to find the correct priors for other situations. There's some further interesting discussion of this paradox that uh, Joyce gives. Subjective Bayesians thus deny that we should adopt a general principle of indifference. Though most admit that it's often quite useful in particular cases when applied carefully. So if we're shuffling cards or rolling dice, maybe the principle of indifference is okay. But when we're considering infinite families of scientific hypotheses, maybe it's got trouble. And so subjective Bayesians suggest that there are generally many different priors that are permissible for rational agents to have in a given situation. Thus, they must say something about the fact that scientists generally do tend to agree as to which pieces of evidence confirm which hypotheses, since different priors will often give different confirmation relations. One set of results that Bayesians often appeal to shows that for any two agents with different priors, as long as neither one assigns credence zero to anything that the other doesn't, so they're not absolutely certain of any different things, if they update by sequentially conditionalizing on the same pieces of evidence, then their credence functions will eventually become arbitrarily close as they get more and more evidence. See chapter six of Ehrman's book and section four of Hawthorne's paper for more details on these theorems. Some care needs to be taken in saying just what measure of closeness will be used and what sequences of evidence will be considered, but the results are often taken to suggest that since most scientists have been exposed to large amounts of the same information as part of their scientific education and from reading published results of the same famous experiments, the credence of scientists will be close enough that they'll tend to agree on the confirmation relations. The fact that there are still some controversies in science can in fact be seen to support this position over objective Bayesianism. However, nothing in these results shows how quickly convergence of the priors will happen unless some bound can be given on the original spread of priors. So the results can only be used in a very suggestive way. Thus, the problem of the priors still remains as perhaps the most significant challenge for Bayesian confirmation theory. It makes Bayesianism seem too subjective for many scientists. Okay, so that's what I have to say on confirmation theory using Bayesianism. Now I'll move to Bayesian epistemology. In addition to its prominent role in confirmation theory, Bayesianism has become a prominent position in epistemology as well. However, since Bayesian epistemology focuses on the graded notion of degree of belief and confirmation, Bayesian probability, while traditional epistemology focuses on the all or nothing notions of belief, justification, and knowledge, some work must be done to say how these two sets of ideas relate. One response endorsed by a few Bayesians is just to deny that the traditional concepts are useful at all. They're just informal notions that should be replaced for technical purposes by a formal notion, just as hot, cold, and warm are approximations that should be replaced by the formal notion of temperature. However, there are many arguments, such as those by Timothy Williamson in his book, Knowledge and Its Limits, that the concept of knowledge at least plays an important explanatory role and that it can't just be disposed of. Also, most Bayesians seem to make use of some sort of notion of belief in explaining what it is to conditionalize on a proposition. However, some will follow Bruno De Finetti and insist that a notion of belief as opposed to degree of belief must just correspond to probability one and thus be an unrevisable certainty. Instead, one should have non-extreme degrees of belief for everything and do everything in purely probabilistic terms. Maybe you don't have to work with the numbers. They can just go on subconsciously in your head the same way that your body works with blood pressures and sugar levels and all those other things that are numerical, but we aren't directly aware of. This position was endorsed by Richard Jeffrey as radical probabilism, and he replaced conditionalization with Jeffrey updating, at least in part, to avoid this update problem of what do you do once something gets to one? However, it's exceedingly hard to avoid using any non-Bayesian notion in one's epistemology. If we follow this idea, then many traditional problems of epistemology can be either solved or dissolved 
although the problem of Cartesian skepticism, roughly that we could be radically deceived about the entire world, apart from perhaps a few very basic truths like I think, therefore I am, the problem of Cartesian skepticism seems to suggest that we could never be certain of anything. This is quite compatible in radical probabilism with the claim that we can rationally have very high degrees of belief in many things. Hume's problem of induction seems to have an even better apparent resolution for the Bayesian. This particular argument that I'm about to give is a simplification of some of De Finetti's work on the notion of exchangeability. I'll have some links in the description for this. It's a way to make sense of the notion of independent identically distributed variables, even if you think that the notion of an object of probability for the variables makes no sense. Consider some universal hypothesis H, say that all ravens are black, to which an agent gives some non-zero prior, and consider a sequence of statements, E1, E2, E3, that are all logically entailed by H. So E1 might be the first raven I see is black. E2 might be the second raven I see is black. E3 might be the third raven I see is black. Upon learning E1 through En, conditionalization and Bayes' theorem shows that one's new credence in H should be given by probability of H divided by the probability of the conjunction of E1 through En. Note, this isn't quite exactly what Bayes' theorem says. However, there's this other term in Bayes' theorem, the probability of E1 through En given EH, and that term is going to be one if this evidence is guaranteed to happen by the hypothesis. So that's why that extra term disappears. One thing to note at this point is, if you weren't absolutely certain that the evidence would happen, but you are absolutely certain that if the hypothesis is true, then the evidence would happen, then you're always taking P of H and dividing it by a number that's between zero and one. That is, you're always increasing the hypothesis. This is why, the Bayesian says, this is why observing a logical consequence of a hypothesis always confirms it. But now we can say more. So we've taken P of H and we've divided by this probability of the conjunction of all these pieces of evidence. But, this probability of the conjunction can be factorized into the probability of E1, probability of E2 given E1, probability of E3 given E1 and E2, and so on, all the way down to probability of En given E1, E2, E3, all the way up to En minus one. That is, this probability of the whole conjunction of evidence is the product of all these numbers that we get by how likely was the first piece of evidence, how likely would I think the first piece of evidence would be if I had already, the second piece of evidence would be if I'd already seen the first? How likely in general would each new piece of evidence be if I already knew the previous ones? And uh, if each of these things was uh, small, if, if these prior, the probabilities of the next piece of evidence given the previous ones, if these probabilities don't gradually get closer to one, then multiplying all these things together would give us something that gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually is uh, less than P of H. And then the posterior of H would have to go above one, which is impossible. Thus, the only way to avoid this impossibility is if your probability for the next piece of evidence, given the past ones, eventually gets close to one. Thus, the Bayesian can show that whatever one's credence is, as long as one has a non-zero prior in some universal hypothesis, the instances of this hypothesis, the individual black ravens, will eventually make the next black raven become uh, very strongly supported. This proof gives no indication of the speed with which the sequence must converge to one, but this seems exactly right from Hume's discussion of the problem of induction. The Bayesian says, eventually some number of observations must make you think that the next one is very likely to be the same. But there's no mathematical rule that tells you how quickly it has to be, except insofar as we know how unlikely you thought some of them were and how unlikely you thought the universal hypothesis was to begin with. 
uh, the requirement that H have a non-zero prior turns out not to be innocuous because this is just the assumption that prevents a problem with Nelson Goodman's new riddle of induction. So in the new riddle of induction, Goodman is not just saying, there's no reason why seeing a bunch of green emeralds should eventually make you think all emeralds are green. He points out, we can come up with terms other than green. He makes up this term GRU, where he says something is GRU if it's green and first observed before 2050, or blue and first observed after 2050. Every emerald I've observed has been GRU, as well as having been green. And should I confirm that every emerald is both GRU and green? That would mean I won't see any more emeralds after 2050. But uh, it turns out that if n observations of green emeralds are sufficient to give the agent credence 0.99 that the next emerald will be green, then she must have assigned, initially assigned credence at most 0.01 to any hypothesis of the form, all emeralds are GRU sub M, where M is the time at which GRU changes from green to blue. Induction is saved without getting an outright contradiction from the new riddle, but the question of how to actually deal with GRU is pushed into the priors. That is, the only reason I end up being convinced that the next emerald will be green rather than the next emerald will be GRU is because my prior was higher for all emeralds being green than for all emeralds being GRU. There's no logical solution to why that's the right one rather than the other. It just pushes it back to the priors, which may be right. Although it may be tempting for some Bayesians to entirely dismiss the traditional notions of belief, justification, and knowledge, most Bayesians admit that there should instead be some interaction between them. In particular, the notions of full belief and degree of belief seem like they should bear some particularly close connection. One popular idea called the Lockean thesis by Richard Foley states that full belief just is having a degree of belief above some threshold T. This is very much like the idea that what it is for the weather to be hot is for the temperature to be above some particular number T. Maybe you think it's hot when it's above 80 and I don't think it's hot until it's above 100, but we each have our own threshold that makes it hot and similarly, Foley suggests maybe each of us has our own threshold that makes degree of belief turn into belief. As tempting as this picture might be, it has some serious problems. One particular type of case is the lottery paradox of Henry Kyberg. If there were some threshold T less than one, such that having degree of belief at least T suffices for full belief in a proposition, then we could consider a fair lottery with more than one over one minus two tickets. That is, if the threshold is 0.99, then let's consider a lottery with more than 100 tickets. If the threshold is 0.999, let's consider a lottery with more than 1,000 tickets. And consider, imagine that you've got one of those tickets. You ought to have degree of belief greater than the threshold that the ticket is not a winner. And thus, the Lockean thesis says, you ought to believe that your ticket won't win. However, many people share the intuition that in these sorts of cases, you don't know that the ticket won't win, and therefore you ought not to believe that the ticket won't win. That would be a contradiction because the Lockean thesis says, once you've got a big enough lottery, your probability that the ticket won't win is above the threshold, and so you should believe it doesn't win. Other people say, you should never believe your ticket won't win until the winner of the ticket of the lottery is announced. Uh, that's a contradiction. Another bigger problem, which I mentioned in the footnote, is we can say the same thing about each particular ticket. And now it looks like we've got a set of contradictory beliefs. I believe this ticket won't win. I believe this ticket won't win. I believe this ticket won't win, and so on. And yet I also believe one of the tickets is going to win. The only way to avoid these problems while maintaining the Lockean thesis is to set the threshold for belief exactly equal to one. But then it seems that we can't count as believing very many of the things we ordinarily believe, since we do normally allow for some slight positive chance of falsehood. Thus, it seems that the connection between degree of belief and full belief must be somewhat subtle. Henry Kyberg suggests that 
the threshold for faux belief may depend on the stakes that are relevant for decisions relating to the proposition in question. Hawthorne and Weatherson argue that the threshold should be one, but that we need to understand agents in terms of contextually specified probability functions rather than a single probability function. So that you get probability one temporarily in an ordinary situation, but once you start considering other possibilities, your probability changes from one. Other proposals can and should be considered. And in fact, there were several interesting ones that came out in the years after this paper. Similar issues arise in the connection between justification and confirmation. It seems very plausible to suggest that in order for a belief in H to be justified by a belief in E, H must be confirmed by E. But Brian Weatherson suggests that some standard anti-skeptical positions in epistemology that he calls dogmatist must reject this principle. There have also been proposals like that in Sherry Rausch's book to link Bayesian notions with the notion of knowledge in order to deal with some of the traditional problems of epistemology. There's a lot of interesting stuff here that this paper doesn't have. Okay, section four, Bayesian statistics. Since Bayesianism claims to be the proper mathematical refinement of epistemology, and statistics is a sort of mathematical applied epistemology for the sciences, it's no surprise that Bayesianism has been extremely influential in statistics. However, to say that this influence has been controversial is a bit of an understatement. Perhaps the biggest debate in statistics, and also in many disciplines where statistics is applied, is whether Bayesian statistics is better justified than the traditional frequentist or classical statistics. Take any controversy you know of, whether it's about critical race theory or intelligent design or climate change or anything else that seems like an academic controversy, go into any science department and ask them about Bayesian or frequency statistics, you'll get a much bigger controversy than that. The debate at its root comes down to one about the interpretation of probability, even though the dispute is not often argued at this level. The frequentist is not interested in anyone's subjective degrees of belief in a proposition, these Bayesian probabilities. She says that the goal of statistical methodology is to provide a strategy for deciding to whether to accept or reject a hypothesis. And you want the strategy for deciding whether to accept or reject to be very likely to get the right decision. This might be because you're a health agency that wants to just announce to people, you should wear masks or don't worry about masks. And you wanna make sure that your statistical test doesn't lead you to give the wrong advice too often. The way you make sense of very likely in this claim is to consider repeating the same experiment many times and see what fraction of those times we would end up making the wrong recommendation. Since the hypothesis either is true or is false, the frequentist doesn't care about how strongly anyone believes it's true or false. And the hypothesis just is true or false. So there's no meaningful frequency of how often it's true or false. There's no probabilities for the hypothesis itself. All there are are the likelihoods of the evidence. So they say they want a test that would reject a true hypothesis no more than, for instance, 5% of the time. And they also want to not accept a false hypothesis any more than 5% of the time. In many cases, it would take more data than we could ever gather to get a test that is this good. So they often make the choice between rejecting the null hypothesis and failing to reject the null hypothesis rather than accepting it. For this sort of test, they tend to try to make sure that we reject the null, null hypothesis in no more than 5% of the cases if it's true, and then try to maximize the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis if it's false. They call that the power of the test. And so as an example, maybe a farmer is interested in whether a new farming method will make her plants grow larger than her old method. She could apply the new method to 100 plants and the old method to 100 plants and then measure their sizes, or maybe it's 100 separate fields. By looking at the standard deviations of the sizes and the differences in the means, and you can calculate the chance that the means of the two samples would be at least this different if there was only a single underlying distribution. This chance of getting 
data, at least as weird as this, given the null hypothesis, is called the p-value of the samples. If this p-value is no more than 5%, called the significance level of the test, then you reject the hypothesis of no difference and accept the hypothesis that the farming method made a difference. The frequentist will tell her not to make any inference of the amount of difference that the method makes, because any such inference will increase the chances of being wrong beyond 5%. The calculation was just for, do you accept that there's a difference or not? Strictly speaking, she shouldn't conclude anything from the particular p-value either. A smaller p-value would have been important if she'd been performing a different test, but all she should pay attention to is what the highest p-value is that would have led her to reject the null hypothesis because that is the probability that she would have made a mistake. It's the rules you adopt at the beginning of the test of under what conditions would I consider the data significant? And did I get significance or not? That's all that matters, not the precise data for the frequentist. The Bayesian, by contrast, says that this distinction between rejecting and failing to reject a hypothesis is a very artificial one. Although those methods are unlikely to lead us to false conclusions, they don't tell us anything about how confident we should be in the conclusion we did draw. If I rejected, how confidently did I reject? If I failed to reject, how confidently do I keep the theory? Bayesian methodology tells us exactly how confident to be in any uh, proposition, given our evidence and our prior. Since no hypothesis is ever rejected or accepted, there's no need to worry about the probability of error. We never make a mistake if we're Bayesians. All we do is have higher and lower probabilities in things that turn out to be true or false. Additionally, the methodology lets us pay attention to the full evidence and not worry about what counterfactual evidence we could have gotten that would have led us to reject the hypothesis. The frequentist made us throw away everything except was it significant or not? The Bayesian says, look at everything. So a farmer whose p-value is substantially, substantially lower than the significance level can be more confident in the hypothesis than one whose p-value is just barely meeting the threshold. And a farmer whose p-value almost meets the threshold, but this frequentist would have said, you didn't get to reject the null. This farmer, according to the Bayesian, can legitimately gain some confidence of difference, even though she can't be too confident that the method really worked. Furthermore, even the frequentist has to admit that in many cases, the exact truth of the null hypothesis is extremely unlikely. How plausible is it that plants grown with the fertilizer and plants grown without the fertilizer grow exactly to the same height? Thus, the frequentist is committed to distinguishing between rejecting the hypothesis as a result of a test and disbelieving it, since a reasonable person should have disbelieved it even in the absence of any evidence sufficient to reject it. In practice, however, the two different methodologies aren't so cleanly separated. Frequentists often do think about confidence that they get from small p-values, even though their interpretation of the procedure gives them no justification for this. Bayesians often do act as though they're accepting or rejecting hypotheses, even though their method gives no bound on the chance of making mistakes. It seems that resolving these debates will require attention to the relationship between the attitudes of degree of belief and acceptance or rejection of hypotheses, as well as sensitivity to the actual goals that scientists want to achieve by means of statistical testing. More on this can be found in volumes like House and Derbach's book and uh, Richard Royal's book. And I mentioned those, those are philosophical discussions of Bayesianism and likelihoodist approaches. Um, there's of course, so many things in statistics that I'm not bothering to cite here. And there's, in fact, even a few years after this came out, I signed on as a co-author for a paper that was advocating the idea that statisticians should change the threshold that they use for p-values. Um, but that's just one bit in a much, much larger debate in statistics. Section five, alternatives to Bayesianism. One thing that tends to make Bayesianism in different disciplines feel like a very different position is the fact that the anti-Bayesians in different fields are very different. Thus, 
Bayesians in one discipline might endorse modifications of the theory that sound completely anti-Bayesian to workers in another discipline. For confirmation theory and philosophy of science, the primary contenders are either older and decisively refuted theories like Hempel's hypothetical deductivism, or modifications of Bayesianism that raise just as many problems as they solve. A few examples are possibility theory by Lotfi Zadeh, dempster schaefer theory, or mushy credences, as Roger White calls them. Many of these alternatives are discussed by uh, Wally in his book on imprecise probabilities, or Halpern. In epistemology, the main alternative to Bayesianism seems to be to just avoid dealing with comparative notions of degree of belief altogether and focus instead on just the traditional notions of full belief, justification, and knowledge. In statistics, the traditional frequentist methodology seems to have significant foundational problems that are worse, I think, than the Bayesian problem of the priors. Perhaps some third alternative or a fusion of the methodologies is needed, but the dispute is clearly an important one. Thus, Bayesianism is an approach, is a position that lies at the nexus of many different disputes in different fields. Whether or not Bayesianism or some modification of it is the correct approach to any of these sets of problems, it allows us to bring to bear techniques developed in these other areas and has been a very fruitful research program. And I should say, I didn't mention here anything in psychology, economics, political science, but these are other disciplines that talk often explicitly about Bayesianism as an alternative to various other approaches. Um, and there's much more to say about this outside of philosophy, but this is what I said in my paper about a decade ago.